We have an announcement today. Um, yes, Alpha. Alpha is starting again. Uh, we have just uh, completed uh, the um, Mandarin, yeah, Mandarin Alpha, and uh, there were also uh, people with the English Alpha that's uh, coming to an end now. And we thank God for those who have accepted the Lord Jesus during this Alpha Online. And uh, the new Alpha Online series is going to start on the 9th of October, 9 p.m. So I'm going to encourage all of you who are interested to sign on. Okay, uh, please contact. Brother Daniel, uh, Daniel in our office, and uh, we would love to have you join us. We love to see more coming to uh, putting their hands into the plow. And we have seen also new converts being equipped and trained to run Alpha, and especially in the uh, Mandarin Alpha. Thank God for them, and we are so very thankful for those who have uh, assisted and put in the effort to make this possible. But most of all, all glory to our Lord Jesus for those who have accepted Him as Lord and Saviour. Without further ado, and I would like to spend uh, this time to introduce our speaker, Dr. Go Kim Chuan. I think he's no stranger. Uh, he's uh, uh, been with us for quite a while. And Dr. Go uh, is a very gifted and a knowledgeable speaker. And uh, he has been... Uh, on the pulpit in SS for quite some time. Today, he's going to speak on Acts 15, verses 1 to 35. And the subject uh, that he's going to deal on is on the subject of conflict. I know this is a very uh, touchy subject, but I know that the Lord will use Dr. Go and uh, prepare him to speak to us. Shall we pray for him? Lord Jesus, we bring Dr. Go before you and ask that you will use him to speak out your heart. Let Him be your voice and let our hearts be malleable and teachable. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning, church. I would like first to thank the leadership for inviting me to speak uh, this morning on the topic of conflict based on Acts 15, verses 1 to 35. It is a long passage, but I think reading the Bible in the context of the sermon, I think it is needful. So it's part of the sermon and we'll read this passage. Uh, I'll read it very quickly. Acts 15 verse 1, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Mo Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul, telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened 
to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. But for the Lord of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Okay, thank, we thank the Lord for the reading of the word. And uh, I'd like to deal with this passage uh, under, well, six headings. <clears throat> I know, <laughs> generally, uh, we are told just to concentrate on three uh, only, but I've got six. Uh, you can see the reason why I have six. It may appear a bit daunting, but I hope within the time given, we are able to complete uh, this whole uh, sermon uh, in the context of Acts uh, chapter 15. Now, I think the first thing that uh, uh, we would like to see first is the context, and then followed by contention. What was it that caused the, the conflict, the contention? What were the issues, or what are the issues? And then the council, the meeting of the elders, apostles, and uh, believers, and then the conclusion of the council, what sort of decision they came to. And then the communique, that means the final statement they made, and communication of their decision to uh, the Gentiles, and then finally cohesion in terms of unity, the idea of unity. So let's look at the context first. I think it's important for us to understand the context. You remember that the first, the earliest church was uh, built, uh, was formed soon after Acts 2, after Peter's sermon uh, to the Jews and also to those who visitors from other places. They heard the gospel and many believed. And the first semblance of a church was formed in Jerusalem. And we can get that in terms of the infant church, what they did. Uh, we can see that in Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. So this was the first church, the infant church that started in Jerusalem. And they were, were made up of Jews mainly. In the next 10 years after that, yeah, uh, the church uh, was formed but because they had so great influence on the Jews, that many Jews turned to Christ, there arose persecution. And because of this persecution, the persecution brought the gospel, as the people scattered to other regions, they brought the gospel to other Gentile regions. And thus, many other churches were established in Gentile cities. And this is where Antioch, uh, in Syria was uh, the third largest city of the then known world, a uh, center for trade, commerce, and idolatry as well. A church was formed there. And so the, the, the church in Antioch was formed. 
And in Acts 11, you also read that Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas was sent by the Jerusalem church to find out about this church at Antioch. And Barnabas sought Paul, and Barnabas and Paul stayed there for one year to teach the believers. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So this was a, a, a major uh, development, but at the same time, there were other churches being formed in other Gentile cities. So let's, let's uh, bear that in mind. So this Antioch was a major uh, church, and the disciples there were called Christians first. But don't confuse that with another Antioch, uh, which, is found, uh, which is located in Pisidia, Pisidian Antioch. That's found in Acts 13 when it was formed. Paul was there. And uh, the map here shows that Jerusalem at the bottom there, in purple, in Israel, and because of persecution, the people went up and uh, to Syria. You can see Damascus and then Syria. And then you see uh, number one there. That is the Antioch that is um, mentioned or that is being discussed in Acts 15. But there is another Antioch, number two, further west, that is found uh, near Galatia, Antioch uh, Pisidia. It's known as Antioch Pisidia. Okay, that, that was a smaller church. So we are going to concentrate only on Acts 15, that is Antioch, Syria. Okay, by Acts 15, the church at Antioch was already well established. Yeah, and that, that could be around 48 or 50 AD after the death of Christ. Yeah. Now, you can imagine that the church at this time in this place and perhaps other places, they experienced for the next 10 years or so maybe a, a, a growth and relative peace. There was no persecution. And it was in this context, we understand that there were other issues that crop up that might cause disunity. Now, the other point to note about the context was that we must also remember that the canon of the New Testament was not ready. We, they didn't have the New Testament that we have in our hand today. So all doctrines and teachings, teachings were done orally, or in some cases written in letters by Paul, uh, by, 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 by the apostles, include Barnabas, Paul, Peter, James, etc., and these were read to the congregations. Okay? So a lot of it done orally. Uh, some letters, not, and these letters may not be read to all the churches. Some churches had it and some may not have it. And then in this situation, there might not be real records of, of the actual teachings. Yeah? It's all by word of mouth and uh, uh, reading the letters. And it was in this context that good leadership was essential to be the gatekeepers of sound doctrines. But at the same time, in this kind of situation where there is no document like our New Testament, that heresies, people who claim to be apostles, would come and preach and teach doctrines that were quite contrary to the teachings of the apostles. So it is very, very important uh, that these things uh, were noted in the context of what we are talking this morning. I think it applies to us too. The pulpits, we should not have uh, give the freedom to anybody to come and, and speak, but I think we need to be very careful uh, who speaks from the pulpit. But once a teaching, a wrong teaching is done, it's difficult to take it back. And because of these many heresies that in fact, Paul had to deal with many of them, Corinth, Galatia, at Ephesus, and also in, in, if you read in 1 John, uh, John had to deal with people who claimed that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. So there were such heresies prevalent even in those early days. Now, then the third aspect that we need to know about the context is that here, in Antioch and perhaps in other cities as well, churches were formed and two distinct groups of believers formed the congregation. Well, it's not difficult to, to, to identify them. Uh, in the New Testament, it's identified as either Jews 
or Gentiles. Gentiles include so many other people, but the Greeks, Romans, and so on. So, but these two groups of people were like oil and water. Yeah? The congregation in Antioch, for example, comprised Jews and Gentile believers with very contrasting backgrounds, mindsets, and prejudices, and many other things. Yeah? So, uh, for example, uh, one aspect of prejudice you can see from this uh, uh, statement made in Acts 10, verses 27, 28. While talking with them, that is Cornelius, Peter went inside, sorry, while talking with him, Cornelius, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware, yeah, uh, these, these people here, they were Gentiles. You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Yeah? So, well, we hear that a little bit in, in our society too. Kafir and, and that kind of thing. So here, the same thing. The Jews, according to the law, were not to associate with or visit a Gentile home. And uh, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. So you can see the extent of prejudice yeah, of the Jews towards the Gentiles. And I'm sure uh, the reverse is, was also true at that time. So given this kind of situation, the church actually, uh, this, this kind of composition of the, the congregation was a fertile ground for disunity. Yeah? The Jews held strongly to circumcision, uh, which is the issue here, and dietary prohibitions. They followed the commandments of the Old Testament, what they could eat and what they could not eat. But the Gentiles remained uncircumcised. We are talking about Gentile believers. They remained uncircumcised and their dietary preferences seemed to be insensitive to the Jews. They still continue eating meat offered to idols, eating blood. Uh, many of us <laughs> like to eat blood, uh, congealed blood in, in food, and also blood sausages and so on. And also meat from animals that were strangled. The blood was still in them. That means blood was not drained out. And, and these to the Jews were, were indeed uh, anathema. So we, that provided a little bit of the context in which uh, the, the contention, the crisis, the controversy, and the conflict came about. So chapter 15 starts with certain people came down from Judea. So obviously from Judea, they were Jews, Jewish believers, to Antioch, and were teaching the believers. And this is what they taught. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, we know that from the New Testament, yeah, uh, circumcision to insist that believers must be circumcised, that touches on fundamental principle of salvation by grace. And if you insisted on that, yeah, then you must insist on the whole keeping of the law. And if that's the case, then the whole issue of salvation by grace through faith in Christ would be undermined. So that is something that we need to recognize is a fundamental principle affecting salvation. But the other aspects have got to do what we call food preferences. What was permitted for people to eat and what were prohibited in Old Testament. That had no eternal consequences, but the first one, yes. Now, it, it appears <coughs> that both issues were dear to the Jews. Yeah? So these issues were very dear to the Jews. They were dictating what the Gentiles should do and eat. 
because of the, their adherence to the Old Testament law. Of course, there were uh, laws forbidding uh, eating blood and dead animals and so on, as I've shown there. And some would argue that it, it predated uh, the law itself under Moses. Genesis 9.4 has that. But, well, they held very strongly uh, to this prohibition. But, of course, it was a, a non-issue to the Gentile believers. Now, the council, how to resolve the dispute? The dispute, if not tackled, yeah, <clears throat> it will lead to disunity, the breakup of the church. And that was, would be very disastrous. Now, the Antioch church had to act. This happened in the church at Antioch, the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay? And they were arguing, perhaps. And the leadership had two options. One is to sweep it under the carpet and, and pretend that it doesn't exist, the problem doesn't exist, or to take concrete action. And therefore, they took the letter. They recognized the potential for conflict because there were very heated debates. Yeah? And then the, the church at Antioch sent apostles and leaders to meet with those in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, the Jerusalem was the center where uh, the first church was formed, comprising holy, almost holy, a Jewish church. And the elder there was James, uh, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they would understand this issue very well. Yeah. And so the decision they made, almost like the headquarters there, uh, would have impact on the rest. And so they sought uh, the opinion and the advice and the wisdom of the people and leaders at uh, Jerusalem. Now, these are some points to note. It's, in a way, a model to solve conflict. In terms of the composition of the council, there were apostles and elders, and Peter was there, Paul was there, Barnabas was there, James was there. So quite a number of distinguished and, and prominent people in the church, and they knew the word of God. They were apostles and elders. Now, the place where it took, it took place was Jerusalem, as I mentioned just now. That's where the first church started, and the Jews were predominant there, and what they say would have impact on the Jews in other regions, in the Gentile churches. Now, the leadership of the council was James. James was basically the chair, and he took uh, that uh, leadership in that council. He was an elder of the Jerusalem church, and you could see from his words, very firm, very clear about the issue, and he was respected. And these are implied in the passage. And then, the way they discussed and how they came to a unanimous decision. Now, I would like to emphasize the word unanimous decision. That means all of them, 100%, agree. It's not by majority vote. Now, when we have voting and we have majority, then there may be some in the leadership that disagree. And that can be a, a problem subsequently. Yeah? But this is important. They discuss the issues. They, they recognize as important. And they came to a unanimous decision. Okay, so there was a resolution, a conclusion uh, of the council, of the meeting. So uh, they needed to have this resolution. Now, you can see from the resolution from the decision made, what was silent, particularly to the Jews. It seems that the issue, it appeared that the issue of circumcision was not addressed. There was nothing, a separate letter to the Jews saying that from now on, this is our stand. But actually, there was no need for that. Yeah? It has been agreed right early on in the preaching of Peter, uh, Acts 2 and, uh, and other portions of Acts, Acts 11, Acts 13, and so on, that it was very clear that the gospel has gone out on the basis of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It was a non-negotiable principle. 
So that is something that was silent, but silence means it was non-negotiable. Okay? There was no need to emphasize that. You can see later that Paul actually writes about this uh, much more in the other epistles. Now, what was articulated to the Gentiles? Yeah? Basically, showing to the Gentiles, believers, be respectful of the sensitivities of the Jewish brethren. Uh, this is negotiable. Yeah? This is negotiable because what was written to the Gentile believers was this, abstain, refrain, avoid from eating those food. And of course, it talks about sexual immorality as well. Uh, why sexual immorality to the Gentiles? I think we can mention that later on. But why not sexual immorality also to the, the Jews? Well, it applies to the Jews, of course. But remember, the Gentiles came from a context, environment of idol, idol worship with all, his, uh, all kinds of lewd and, 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 and terrible uh, acts of, of debauchery, as Paul uses the word, uh, uh, and uh, prostitution, and, and so, so on. There's a whole slew of things associated with idol worship at Ephesus and many other parts of the then known world. So the letter was basically to assure the Gentile believers, in terms of your faith, you, you are secure. It's by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It is by God's grace. There's no need for you to follow the Jewish law or keep the Jewish law. But do refrain. Do be sensitive to the sensibilities of the Jewish brethren. Avoid some of these things which you enjoyed before. Uh, but now you are together in, in the church and be respectful of one's, one another's sensitivities. So what lessons can we learn from the conclusion reach? One, there's clarity on what is fundamental and what is preferential. Okay? What is fundamental is non-negotiable. Yeah? Uh, what is preferential, we can advise. Okay. Number two, priority was church unity on the basis of truth, not compromise. Now, many a times we want unity, but we compromise on many of the essential things. But here, priority was church unity, no doubt about that. But it must be on the basis of truth, of doctrine, not compromise. And then there is unanimity in decision reach. Not majority decision. I would like to emphasize that. Not majority. Uh, many a times uh, in, in the over, oversight, for example, or leadership, uh, I have been an elder before for many years in Singapore, and it's not such thing as a majority decision. I think where there's some dissent, we won't decide and make a decision immediately. We'll pray about it and until we reach that unanimous decision so that everyone is happy with it. Now, after the council meeting, there's a need to communicate the decision to Antioch and to other churches as well, to the Gentile churches. Because the Gentile church at Antioch, maybe Syria and Cilicia as well, maybe sent people to Jerusalem to get a resolution to their controversy. And so they sent back the decision. Uh, and you can see here, uh, it was found in Chapter 15, verses 23 to 29, but also reiterated in Acts 21, 25. As for Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. There's no change in terms of the four items there. Uh, this is where I'd like to mention again. Uh, sexual immorality and idolatry is being, being mentioned there uh, clearly. And you can see a bit of expansion of this in Romans 1, 18 to 32, about idolatry and idolatrous ways uh, of, of doing things in terms of changing human behavior. And uh, Galatians 5, 19, 20 uh, gives an idea of the kinds of sexual immorality and adultery being practiced by the Gentiles at that time in idol worship. And that's why 
uh, discommunicate mention about sexual immorality. Avoid those things that you used to be in, uh, in the habit of doing. Now, you are separate. You avoid them completely, abstain from them. And then Judas and Silas accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Antioch, saw the letter read, and they returned to Jerusalem to confirm what had happened. So here, there was a closing of the loop that there was an issue, issue was brought to Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem made a decision and brought back to Antioch, and then the communique was read, and everything was uh, received, and people were happy, and then these two uh, brothers, uh, Judas and Silas, went back to Jerusalem to tell and report to James that everything was now fine. So on circumcision, we could say that there was no need to establish, re-establish that because Peter said in verses 7 to 11 of chapter 15, that held true. There was no change. There's no need to reiterate in the letter. Verse 11, Peter says, No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And that has been uh, reinforced by Barnabas, by Paul, and many others, as well as James and so on. So what lessons can we learn from the above? The leaders were clear about what they were discussing. They worked really well together, each having space to air their views. Yeah? There was time when Paul spoke, uh, uh, Barnabas spoke, and, and James spoke, and Peter spoke, and so on. They worked really well together, each having space to air their views. But James took the leading position as chair because he was the elder there. They listened to one another. And that's, that's important. We need to listen to one another. Then they drafted a common letter, and it was a unanimous decision because it's mentioned there, we, not I. I, James didn't say, I decided on this. No, we came to this decision. And they chose Judas and Silas to accompany Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch to bring the decision back, which, is, which was a wise move. And they all, from the discussion, from the whole episode, one could come to this conclusion that they all showed much wisdom, maturity, and humility. I think the last one is very important to emphasize. Humility to one another and to the church as a whole, even to the group of Pharisee believers. I think they showed this, uh, and this is commendable. Yeah. Finally, we come to the point, cohesion. It is so important for the church of God to remain united. And that's the whole purpose of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us, to bring salvation to both Jews and Gentiles, to bring the two together. Yeah? So as a consequence, as a result of all this, yeah, the unity of the church at Antioch and other churches, local churches everywhere, was preserved. Yeah? And that is very important. We need to maintain the unity as far as possible. Now, on circumcision, there might have been heated discussion, but it was a non-negotiable issue. So it was very clear salvation was through faith in Christ and not through works of the law. Now, if you study the other books, uh, uh, epistles of Paul, which came later after perhaps uh, some came, uh, well, around at the time of uh, Acts were about to be recorded, or maybe a few years after that. Now you can see that in Paul's teachings, in Romans 2, 25, 29, 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 20, uh, Paul says there, after quite a long discussion, he says that each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. So if you are circumcised, b b a Jew, you remain, of course, you remain in that situation. But if you want to be circumcised, following the tradition, by right, you should also follow the rest of the law. But there was no need. But if you wish, I mean, that, that's not a, an issue. But to insist on others, then the Gentiles, Paul says, you remain as you were when God called you. You were uncircumcised, you remain in them because you must not 
be burdened by these additional rules. And in Galatians, there's a lot of discussion on if it, uh, circumcision being added to uh, the gospel uh, a criterion for, for belief. Instead of faith alone, they said everybody must be uh, circumcised. So Ephesians 2 and Colossians chapter 2 and also Titus 1.10, there's a mention there about the, those who champion circumcision. The issue did not die after uh, Acts 15. So the letter written to Gentiles was an advice, not a command. You will do well to avoid these things. So more of an advice to Gentiles to respect the sensitivities of their Jewish brethren. That means in terms of their food preferences. And of course, the other one, uh, sexual immoral immorality, you have to put a stop to that. Now, I just want to summarize at the end of it. Paul says in Ephesians 2, uh, he said, For he, which is Christ himself, is our peace, who has made the two groups one, that means Jews and Gentiles, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law. Remember, he has set aside in his flesh the law with all its commands and regulations, including circumcision. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. I think that summarizes the whole, uh, the whole uh, this sermon uh, this morning. So, what have we learned from this passage? Well, from the whole passage of uh, Acts 15, 1 to 35, we can see there a wonderful model for conflict resolution. Now, when you talk about conflict, there are so many other kinds of conflict. But in this case, in terms of doctrinal issues and uh, practices as well. But I just want to add a bit more uh, that the people who were involved in resolving this conflict were very clear. There, were, there was clarity on three main goals. One is the glory of God. Yeah? The glory of God is important. And then the purity of doctrine. And then the unity of the church. Can you imagine if the unity of the church is uh, undermined, the, this breakup of the church, then the doctrine is being questioned and then the name of God will be blasphemed among the Gentiles. So they were clear on these three main goals. The glory of God, the purity of doctrine, the unity of the church. And I think this applies to us today when we have such conflicts in our midst. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Go, for sharing your heart with us. Thank you for your thoughts and also the Word of God that reminds us. Indeed, all of us uh, need a reminder and uh, allowing God to mould our lives so that we may yield to Him. Where areas that uh, we have not submitted and um, we ask that the Lord will be gentle and to deal with us even as we go through sometimes conflicts. But thank God that He is a merciful God. And I believe that the Lord, uh, in His mercies, will continue to mould us through this period of sanctification, that we may grow and grow to be more like Christ. We come to the end of the service. We want to wish all of you a happy holiday, uh, a happy weekend, even as you spend time with your family, Enjoy lunch, uh, enjoy dinner, enjoy family time together. I pray that God will bless all of you. And for any one of you who, are, who want to speak to any of the elders or any of the leaders, you can always click to the uh, link below and uh, connect with us. We would love to connect with you, pray with you, and uh, to share uh, whatever resources that we have with you. The Lord bless you and uh, keep you and His face shine upon you all. In Jesus' name, Amen.